Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Navigating the Road to Cyber Resiliency, a summit made possible by Dell Technologies. Gil Hecht is here, remote from Tel Aviv, Israel. Gil, our first thoughts are with you and all the innocent souls in the region. We hope you and your family are doing okay. We pray for your safety. Gil is the co-founder and CEO of, uh, founder and CEO of Continuity. Welcome to the program, Gil. Thank you, Dave. Thank you for welcoming me. Hey, why did you, I love to ask founders this question. Why did you uh, start Continuity? So it was post 9-11 and companies um, who hoped that they have a disaster recovery system in place and they're able to recover their data. Many companies found that they actually cannot because of various complexities related to data recovery. And uh, so we started continuity in order to help them make sure that they can manage the risk related to business continuity, resilience, and and most importantly, the ability to recover. Well, it's, so it's, kind of, it, it's obviously very important, right? When things go wrong, and things always go wrong with technology, you've got to be able to recover. But how has that, I mean, post 9-11, I mean, that a lot has changed. And we learned, we've oh, yeah. learned a lot about recovery, you know, post 9-11. How has that sort of whole concept of your founding premise, how has that evolved over the last, let's see, tw uh, 20 plus years? So you really bring me back to the times in which I was uh, young and beautiful. <laughs> um, You're still beautiful, so, Gil. <laughs> I got to okay. tell you, you're looking good. Thank man. you. I'll, I'll have it in writing, please. Yeah. Uh, so, so we started really by helping companies, uh, making sure they're able to recover the data. And we, and we worked with, literally hundreds of large enterprises to help them make sure that they configure their recoverability correctly. And as things started to, pro to progress, we started to understand that companies also have issues with their clustering and we help them manage their clustering issues to make sure they also keep continuity. So, you know, resilience is about recoverability, continuity. And, and we managed that for them for many, many years, as, as, uh, as you mentioned. And then a few years ago, we started to hear from customers that they are suffering from something new that was called the ransomware. And, and we, we were not very familiar with ransomware at the time. Originally, resilience and recoverability was meant to recover from, you know, an earthquake, uh, a major catastrophe, maybe a human error. And then, they started telling us, those customers, about the fact that they, they need to prepare for ransomware and some of our customers even suffered ransomware. And, and when we started to learn why is that happening, what is ransomware, what, what's really going on, we learned that the world of cybersecurity, while it's very advanced and has lots of solutions, kind of ignored storage and backup for a very long time. Um, and, and maybe I'll, I'll take you through you know, a few details on that. Um, if, if you really look at, at uh, what people are doing for security of all the layers that they have in IT, you know, all the way from firewalls, uh, networks, endpoints, servers, database servers, web servers, app servers, you name it, the most important piece is they securely configure this infrastructure in order to make sure that no matter what happens and no matter if a hacker comes or not, they're going to be ready. Things are going to be ready. Everything is going to be secured properly. And, and there is a name for that. It's, some organizations call it secured configuration. Some organizations call it uh, security posture management. There are all kinds of various names for it. And when you look at what happens in, in, in backup and what happens in storage and what happens in storage management and, and backup appliances and storage networking and storage services on the cloud, you learn that all those uh, processes and technologies are not yet implemented really in, in uh, storage and in backup. So security uh, and specifically secured configuration and security posture management doesn't really exist in a central way uh, in those areas. Um, and, and when we started to learn more and more about it, we understood why it happened, we understood all those things, but what we didn't understand is how come the single most important area of IT really, and especially as it comes to cybersecurity and, and ransomware, uh, the, the real, where, where all the data is sitting, you know, 
if you look at the risk, um, if, if a hacker hacks an endpoint, right, or, or a server, uh, it's very unpleasant. He can, he can steal data, he can erase data, he can corrupt data, he can encrypt data. It's, it's pretty terrible, but it's really no big deal. I mean, the organization has a backup, they can recover the server, and the server doesn't hold all that much information. But if you look at the storage array or a storage management system or, or the storage layer or the backup layer, God forbid, uh, every storage array will typically hold about a thousand, uh, the data of about a thousand servers and, and every backup uh, appliance can hold even more than that. And in many cases, those are managed centrally. So if a hacker gets to the storage or backup area, he can literally wipe an organization clean. There will be nothing left by the time he's finished. So when we learned all that, and I'm sorry for the long story, but uh, it was exciting for us. When we learned all that, it, it basically caused us to stop, to, to stop what we were doing. We didn't really stop. We continued to provide resilience management, but it literally caused us to build a new business unit within continuity that will focus solely on the area of cyber resilience and, and more specifically on the area of security posture management for storage and backup. And that's really how Storage Guard uh, was born. So much to unpack there. I mean, we talked to a lot of CIOs and CISOs during the pandemic who said, basically echoed what you said, Gil, that they were thought DR was their sort of business resilience strategy. The other thing I'm hearing from you is that, that backup and recovery were a bolt on, it's sort of an afterthought, which we talk about all the time. It can't be, it's never effective when it's an afterthought. And then of course, ransomware, which was this new thing and ransomware itself has evolved. And that's what I want to ask you about it. it, it our understanding, we talked to a lot of, of, of organizations to say that it used to be they would you know, encrypt uh, and, and then you know, extort. And now they're basically exfiltrating yeah. and then they extort and say, hey, we're going to release all this data. So they, they sometimes don't even bother encrypting. Um, and, and then of course, if you pay the ransom, sometimes you get your data back, sometimes you get the keys, sometimes you get you know, some of the data back. So what has been the progression just in this short period of time of sort of the state of ransomware? So, you know, initially, when we look a few years back, initially ransomware was really a very simple thing. It was like, a, it was a virus that knew how to infect systems. It didn't really know what it infects. And when it infected something, it would encrypt the disk and give you this uh, phone number to call or this uh, Skype number to call or whatever, this method or this email to, to email so that you'll be able to get the key to uh, unencrypt the data. And that was, you know, it was, uh, I would say, it had a, a significant effect on small and medium businesses, but it wasn't really a big deal for the enterprise because in the enterprise you can recover, everything has a backup, no big deal. Then hackers started to also leak the information, sometimes as a way to pressure the organization and sometimes uh, as a strategy to kind of get, you know, a bit more, uh, a few more Bitcoins out of this uh, event. It started to affect the enterprise in a significant way. I think uh, there were a few, a few interesting events. Maybe Sony was one of the most interesting ones, but it really started to affect the enterprise in a significant way when hackers started to make those ransomware attacks much more sophisticated and started to delete the backups as the first step before they go after production. Right. And suddenly from a nonsense that goes after SMB, you have this major threat that can literally wipe an organization clean and this is dangerous. And hackers really learned that the data is in the storage and in the backup and you, and you cannot even start from primary storage. You literally have as a hacker if you want to get some money out of this, and by the way, this is no advice for hackers. So don't, uh, please, I, mean, it's, I hope hackers don't watch this show. So, but, but anyway, if they understood that if they want to get a few dollars out of it, they really need to erase the backups before they erase primary storage or before they encrypt the primary storage. And when they started to do it, it became a major catastrophe. And by the way, that was around the time in which we started to develop Storage Guard, uh, which is the product that we have to help enterprises guarantee secure configuration across everything that participates in storage and backup so that hackers, A, will not be able to get in and B, will not be able to do much damage even if they manage to get in. So we haven't actually talked much about product at the summit and in the series. We're kind of a little, 
we're kind of jonesing for a little discussion on products. So what is Storage Guard? You've got very specialized expertise at Continuity. What exactly is Storage Guard? Can you unpack it for us, Gil? Sure. So Storage Guard basically brings uh, three key capabilities to the enterprise that, that today are not really uh, widely spread. So if, if you go and ask your typical um, you know, chief information security officer, let's say, if they currently do uh, whatever, let's call it vulnerability assessment for, for their IT, they'll ask, their answer will be, oh yes, absolutely, of course, we do a vulnerability assessment for IT, we do it on an annual basis, and we have a system to make sure that we're always securely configured. And that's awesome. And then if you ask him, okay, that's great, are you currently doing vulnerability assessment for storage and backup? I mean, you have lots of components, all the data is there, it's very important, are you doing it? And the answer is in 90 or let's say in 80% of cases, the answer would be, well, actually no. And, and in 20% of cases, it will be, yeah, we, do, we have this in-house team that's working very, very hard and, and they're doing the research and they're writing signatures and they have DevSecOps people and they have uh, scripts and they're doing all kinds of stuff. And, and yes, they, they make sure our, our storage and backup is secure. And then if you ask all of them, well, that's great, but wouldn't you want a product to test your storage and backup and, and, and do all that automatically and enjoy the economies of scale of a company that's doing it for all customers and not just for, for you. I mean, you don't need to have a team for that. You don't have a team doing antivirus for you, right? The answer in 100% of cases is of course, you are absolutely, of course, we want to have a, an external vulnerability assessment as opposed to an internal one. And of course, we want to have something that will keep our configuration secured at all time. And that is, that is exactly what Storage Guard does. So it really has three key capabilities. One, it knows how to automatically detect CVEs in storage and backup and provide remediation advice. So CV common vulnerabilities, so to say, or bugs in code that you may receive from various uh, vendors or components. Number two, we automatically with Storage Guard detect security misconfigure, misconfiguration and deviation from vendor best practice, industry best practice, security best practice, security standards, NIST, ISO, and whatnot. And again, provide remediation advice as well as automatic uh, auto fixing, so to say, or automatic remediation. And number three, we provide with all the compliance capabilities required by the enterprise to be able to exhibit to their internal auditors, external auditors, etc., um, that they are protected. And the way they do it is by literally printing out all the checks that they did for each system and subsystem with a check when it was checked, all the details that we collected, which is basically the proof required to be able to prove you you were actually well protected. And, and we put those product and we put this all this into a product that knows how to scan every, ven every vendor uh, in storage, backup, storage management, storage networking, storage services, and this entire area. So that's, this is Storage Guard in a nutshell. I can keep on going for like, two and a half hours. Yeah, well, thank you for that detail, because uh, as I said before, you've got very specialized expertise. And I'm hearing, you look, backup and recovery, it can't just be a afterthought. It can't even be an adjacency to cybersecurity. It's got to be a fundamental component. And just listening to you describe uh, what your solution does, uh, and, and particularly when you talked about compliance, I I'm curious, how does AI you know, generally and specifically generative AI change that whole experience uh, for your customers? So generative AI is, and, and large language models, is an amazing revolution. It really is. It's exciting, you know, it's exciting for us personally. We all go to ChatGPT, we all do crazy stuff with it. We all integrate it into our products and this is awesome. But specifically in the security world, it's an unbelievable, huge threat. Because if you look at how hackers operate today, they use lots of manpower in order to be creative in how they attack, they attack an enterprise. And they use two main ways. One is they, they use social engineering, which is basically someone picks up the phone and, and tries to convince someone to give him the password or some more advanced variations of that, sends an SMS with a link or stuff like that. And the second piece is they generate code that tries to do either brute force attack or try all kinds of 
penetrate known uh, vulnerabilities, zero day or non zero day alike. The problem with Gen AI or, or the challenge that we all have with Gen AI as security companies is that it allows you to be, to, to be creative at an infinite scale. So, so basically you can, instead of hiring lots of people, you can do Gen AI and LLM to be infinitely creative in both human engineering, because you can generate any new, any new message that you cannot really trace or, or locate, and it can generate any piece of new creative code that's gonna try to do brute force with a huge brain of having read all the internet. So the problem is that suddenly every organization is becoming a hundred times more exposed to very creative minds, which is not really a mind, it's, it's LLM and Gen AI that's attacking it. And I think if we thought that security is important until now, security is gonna be 10 times or 20 times more important now that Gen AI is in the hands of hackers and not just in the hands of, you know, my daughter who is uh, being very creative with it. Right. So my last question, my understanding is you also have an investing background, yes? Right. You, I was a VC twice. Yes, and so you've got some interesting perspectives, I'm sure, Israel, Startup Nation, I know you've got other priorities, you know, right now as a nation, uh, but what are maybe some of the investing themes particularly they might be related to threats that people aren't thinking about so much. If you had to sort of put on your, you know, the break out the binoculars and think ahead, think, think about, you know, your investing expertise. What are some of the themes that you think are people should be paying attention to in the coming years? So I would, I would say that in general, there are two areas in which uh, an investment is worthwhile in security and, and, and in general. One is the forefront of uh, technology, because if you capture the market early, you're able, to, you're able to become number one or number two and grow very fast and, and become the de facto standard. And that's why you see lots of VCs chasing the, the, the frontier, even though nine out of 10 companies will fail, will miserably fail and burn a lot of cash. It still makes sense. It's still a good investment. The other side is you want to go after huge untapped markets regardless if they are, you know, ancient, new or whatnot. And take, for example, uh, Uber, right? Uber is a great example. Hexi is not a new technology. And even mapping wasn't a new technology at the time when they came about. When they came about. But the combination of internet and mapping enabled the taxi business, which is quite ancient, so to say, to become an amazing success. And it was a, an untapped market that just enjoyed this uh, a bit of new technology. So those are the two areas that I try to invest in, at least in my spare time, when I'm not busy with securing the storage. Yeah, I love that answer. It's not just about a particular technology, it's about a framework of, and a philosophy of investing. Gil Heck, thanks so much for coming on the program. Really appreciate your time. Thank you, Dave. Okay, you're watching Navigating the Road to Cyber Resiliency, which is a summit made possible by Dell Technologies, the analyst panel is next. You don't want to miss this. Keep it right there.